Welcome to the third episode of Palk Talk. We are your hosts, Angelo and Jano. Jano, how are you doing today? Yeah, good, Angelo. Um, it's just stage four lockdown here in Melbourne, so doing doing the best we can. But yeah, I'm excited to talk about Palk today. So awesome. Yeah, I, I think we're all doing the best we can. It's definitely an interesting time we're living in. So hope everyone listening is staying safe. And uh, yeah, so let's just jump right into it. Um, so let's first talk about before we talk about the Crescent R game. And Europe and any transfers coming in. Um, let's talk about Friday's game versus Atromitos. How did you see that game? Why were we so flat? Um, you know, it seems like in the second half we were we were flat from the, from the get go. Um, what do you think it was? Do you think it was a sense of fatigue, a sense of the, the tactics, a lack of striker? How do you see that game? Yeah, I think everything you said is probably played a role into why we were a little bit flat. Um, I don't think it was exactly unexpected after a big European result and a win. There is a tendency, not only for bulk, I think if you look across Europe, there tends to be a bit of a flat, the next game is a flat performance. Just right. I don't know if the players emotionally struggle to recover, to get up after being on such a high then to kind of focus again, prepare yourself, and then go again within two days. Mm -hmm. So it's something that does happen. I think that played a role. I mean, our scoring in Greece, even in the playoffs since we switched to this formation, hasn't been great. Like defensively, we've tightened up a lot. Right. So I think it's just a reoccurrence of that problem. So I think the biggest thing was the emotional it was the emotional toll that the Benfica game took, but. The lack of a striker, I think it's clear. We all know that that's something that we need. Mm -hmm. Svidevsky, for all he's trying, he's definitely very much a poacher. He needs to be in the box. He needs a chance to fall to him. He's not going to make something happen on its own or make a goal out of half a chance, which is something that we needed on Friday night. And right. it's probably something we're going to need um, until kind of the players are well and truly comfortable with this formation because it's still relatively new. We only we halfway through the playoffs, we um, Ferrero turned to that to this formation, and it's only been a few games this season. So I think a striker definitely. What do you think? Do you think a striker is going to help? Yeah, yeah. Point? I think I think with with you know whoever we get now, because I think it's inevitable that we're going to get someone. Um, I think that whoever we get, um, hopefully it's someone that feeds into our playing style. Um, so regarding the game, I think it's it's a combination of a couple things. I think one obviously is a lack of striker, but ultimately when you're playing at home against you know mid table team, I think you know th those are the games that you gotta win. Um, I think it was more of a, a lack of interest and the focus on the uh, the Champions League game. Not saying that they went into the game thinking or it's just saying whatever happens happens. You know if we lose we lose if we tie we tie. I think it's more of a you know, let's not get hurt. Uh, let's make sure we're healthy. Let's make sure we're fit for the for the next game, because that's ultimately the thirty million dollar game, right? Or the twenty million dollar game, or Euro yep. game, however you want to say it. Um, yes, that game is the the most important the game, I think. In you know, along with the Ajax games a couple of years ago in Pauk history, right? Because I think yeah. ultimately, if, if we make the Champions League group stages this year, the 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 trajectory of the Pauk's history will change forever. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. that, you know, right, with, with our fan base, with our you know, historical um, significance to not only the Greek League, but to the city of Thessaloniki, of the people, I think with if we make the group stages, that will be huge for our – it will change Pauk's history for the future, um, yeah, the, the trajectory of it. So I, this is technically, I, I would say, the biggest game in, in Pauk history right now, right? Because you know they've never made, we've never made the group stages. This would be something huge, but ultimately, you know, next year I think Greece only gets one team in the Champions League, if I'm correct, because of the, correct, the coefficients with with the 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 second division coming up in the Europa League. Um, so if we drop too many points early on. Olympiacos, they're not going to drop points. They're deep, right? So I, I feel we cannot afford to be taking games off in the league because, yes, we can make the group stage now, right? We can make the group stage, get our money, get more coefficient points for Greece and for us. But if we finish second or third next year, what good does that do us? You know, 
Um, so I think it needs to be, and again, I'm not saying Ferreira came out and said, you know, don't worry about this game. But if we're going to be a team that we consistently make the Champions League, if we consistently make, you know, if we fi- fi- can finish top two in the Greek League, I, you know, even top, we need to win it now because next year they're not going to, we wouldn't be in the Champions League because only one team makes it. Um, we're going to need to make sure that we focus on every single game individually. It's important as the last game because if we drop points early on, you know, I don't see Olympiacos losing many points, you know, dropping many points. I think they're a really good team, a really deep team. So that's something that we cannot do. Um, again, yeah. I, I, I don't think that we're giving up. I just think subconsciously that we're focusing on the other game. Yeah. Would you, would no, you agree with that? 100%. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there's a natural um, preservation of self when in between you know, these European games. The other thing I, we need to say too is that he did make a few changes. So, um, right. As City, who I know is a lot of fans don't like him, I think he has a role to play, but it's clear it's not in games against Atromitos where we're going to dominate position. Right. We're going to boss right. position. So, you know, heard he, um, he actually did dribble a few players and, you know, took a shot. I don't think he's ever scored in professional football. So, <laughs> um, he did, he, he did his best with his, um, with his limited ability, especially on the ball. But yeah, I think that was maybe a bit of a mistake. I understand Ferreira wanted to risk rest El Caturi. He is a little bit injury prone, especially with a few games. So, but maybe like Nimua was the way to go. I, he might not trust him yet. He did come off the bench, but I think in games like this where you boss possession, you need as many players as possible. Especially when you only have two in midfield, you need as many players as possible that are good on the ball, that can play passes, or that right. can drive with the ball. So, I think that limited us a little bit, but. You know, like you said, I think um, focus is the biggest thing. You can't look too far ahead because I agree with you. Olympiacos isn't going to drop points unless it's against the bigger teams. So we need to maintain. We need to keep getting three points. Keep getting three points mm-hmm. and stay in t- stay hot in the heels because it's going to be it's going to be a tough league to win as it is most years. Right. Yeah. That, you know, I think a CT is good for the the, the games where we need to defend. Um, right against teams that park the bus. Uh, you know, pack the bus that stay back. We need players that are going to be shifty, that can break the the opponent's defense. But yeah, it's interesting. I, I didn't know that Asiti's never scored a goal. I looked it up right now, and he's you know since 2012, he hasn't scored a single goal in professional play. So that that first goal celebration better be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually have a knack. I don't know if you remember, but Ganyas was the same. He hadn't scored a professional goal either, and then I think he ended up scoring two or three with us. Um, so yeah, yeah. And he actually scored a, a great goal against um against Basel. Yeah, I, I, I was watch, Yeah, I, I was telling you earlier off off air is that I watched the Spartak game, but I also watched the the Basel game, and uh, that goal was one of the best goals I've seen. That and then yeah. I don't know if you remember um, uh, what was his name? Uh, it was uh, someone against Ari scored. Um, Athanasiadis, maybe. No, no, uh, no. It was uh. <laughs> oh man, it was a, a the left the... winger. He was, I think, an African player. Kamara. Um, yes, Kamara. Yes. Yeah. His goal yeah. against Aris, I think, it was a volley from the left yeah. side. Right. It was a cross and then a volley. Those were the top two goals I've seen. But uh, yeah, no. So I think, like you we were saying, it's the formation, not the formation, more so. It's just the the players that were chosen. I know you have to give players rest, but like like we both said, and I'm sure a lot of people agree with, we can't afford to to drop points. Yep, hundred percent. All right, so you know that's good. Um, let's talk about Zivkovic, right? He's had two goals so far. Um, he scored against his former team, uh, Benfica. Uh, he scored against Atromitos. Um, overall, how would you say his performances are? Are you liking what he uh, what you're seeing? Would you keep him on the bench um, in the the Champions League playoff rounds? Would you start him? What would you do? Yeah, so with Zivkovic, Adria Zivkovic, we should say, obviously, not our not Zivko, our goalkeeper. Right. Um, he, yeah, obviously the goals have been great, and he came with not a great goal scoring record. So I think we're all a little bit. Um, 
curious to see if his finishing was poor or he was just kind of he was just a purely assist player but scoring two goals off the bat is, is a great return for any player so right. he's done well in that aspect obviously scoring the goal against his former team I'm sure he had a little bit of drive to do that just a little bit of extra motivation mm-hmm. and it ended up being the winner um, as we said the other day so in terms of how he went against Atromitos especially given we were so flat he was in the first half he was trying things he wanted to get on the ball. He was trying to make things happen. It wasn't quite coming off for him, but he was trying things. As the game wore on, and especially after the goal, you could see him kind of click into gear, get into rhythm, and he started beating players, and he looked really good. And he looked like our biggest threat all game. Right. Um, him and Giannulli sends up with the assist again against Atromitos. Just, um, again, bumping up that price by another million, I think. <laughs> every, every assist, every time <laughs> he's got a hand in a goal. Right. Um, so without those two, like we looked quite toothless in attack. So he was good against Atromitos. You can see he's still finding his feet, like I said, but the goal did him a world of good confidence wise. And yeah, no, I'm really I'm excited to see what he can do for us this season. Obviously he's come with a lot of, you know, hype. We spoke about it a couple episodes ago, how it's the type of signing we need to make, and he's looking good for that. In terms of starting him, I think it's a matter of time until he becomes a starter. Now, the question then becomes, whose place does he take? We know he's not a striker. We know we're going to sign a striker. So it's Belkas or Tzolis, who Ferreira obviously rates both. Mm -hmm. Um, Belkas is a captain. I mean, that doesn't really... Bao kind of has a couple of captains, so I don't think that's going to keep Belkas in the 11 necessarily. He's shown that he's not afraid to drop, you know, anyone. So I don't know, out of those two, who would you be dropping? I don't really know. So so personally, I would drop Tzolis. I think that... Pelkas can offer a lot more um, in terms of, you know, I, I just think he's a staple in the lineup. I think Tolis is someone that we could bring on if we need a goal. Um, now, I'm not saying that anyone's bad. I'm not saying that Tolis is worse than Pelkas. I'm just saying yeah. in, in, if we ha- if someone had a gun to my head and said you either had to pick Tolis or Pelkas to sit for Zivkovic, you know, I would say Tolis um, in terms of, you know, Obviously, he's off to a great start. Don't get me wrong, but I think Pelkas can offer more. I mean, his attacking of the of defenders so far this year has been great. And and what you mentioned earlier is that you know Ferreira is not afraid to sit anyone. Pelkas went through a little spell last year, last season, where he didn't play in a in a good amount of games in a row. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many, but it, he was coming off an injury, and then. Um, I believe he was healthy, but he still didn't play him because there was other players playing better than him. I think obviously Tolis is getting the the accolades and the the, the press, um, the, the the I guess you could say not the favoritism, but you know he's getting the the, the popularity of the press right now because he's a young player, he's a wonder kid, you know, so forth and so on. But I think Pelkas is is a heartbeat to this team and. And I'm not. I wouldn't call myself a, a fanboy of him. I just think right now he's playing well. He's he's working hard. I think the team feeds off of his energy. So if it was up to me, I, I would I would sit. Um, not I wouldn't say sit, but I would bring Solis off the bench for uh, Zivkovic to start. Um, and then the thing about Solis is you could play him up top, and I know we're gonna talk about that later if if he, if he's could come in as a striker. Um, but you have a lot more options rather than if Belka sits and you start Zivkovic, you know, Belka's can only play one position more so. Um, so th- that's the route I would take. Yeah, look, that's that's fair. That's probably like the most logical choice would be Tzolis to go out. The only thing I have, Zivkovic, the only question I have about that, Zivkovic seems to prefer playing on the right or the two games he's played or right. the couple games he's played for us he's played on the right. And Belka's as well is better on the right because obviously, I mean... I know with his formation, Belkas kind of slides into the middle and kind of plays like a pseudo number 10 because obviously the wing backs kind of have free reign of the of the wings. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure Belkas coming from the left. Just from memory, I feel like he hasn't had great games on the left-hand side. Right. So, I mean, yeah, look, I'm sure that's something that Ferreira will have to work out. But, um, yeah, like I'm saying, like especially if Belkas is on the left, then he definitely will have to – he would definitely will slide into the middle because we know that Yanulis loves – you know, loves that overlap and loves to have that left flank to himself. So I agree with you. I think Solis will be the one in time. But you know what? If he continues the form and keeps scoring, it's going to be hard to drop him. So he might be in for a couple of uh, sleepless nights, Mr. Ferreira. 
Right. Yeah. So so speaking about the the, the sleepless nights and Ferreira is gonna have, and we're gonna be getting players. Um, we got someone today. Uh, it was it was funny because I wanted to message you that we got him because I w- I was on Twitter just surfing the web and all of a sudden I searched Pauk and in 58 seconds prior to my search someone posted something that we had gotten this right back Musa Wagwe. Um, oh, and I was gonna, your, your, your Pauk senses were tingling. My Pauk senses exactly. Um, and I I wanted to just talk t- to send it to you, but it was like three four o'clock in the morning for your time. So I was like, eh, I'll just send it to him, see when he wakes up and gets it. But yeah, so uh, it looks like I appreciate we, that. It looks like we officially got Musa Wagwe, who's coming out loan from Barcelona. Um, he hasn't played at many top level matches. Uh, but he's, he is a young player. He's twenty one years old. Um, he was included in Senegal's uh, 2018 World Cup squad. He started in two matches at the World Cup, um, and he scored against Japan, making him the youngest uh, African player to score in the World Cup game. Um, and then he came in off the bench in the third. So he's he's a well you know versed player. He's um, I wouldn't call him a wonder kid, but I think he has a lot of potential. Um, you know, I'll start off with some things about him, then I'll get your opinion. I love this move. I think it's a really, really big move, and it's a move that I think that can take Pauk to the next level. In the terms of when you get someone on loan from a, or even buy, right? So if you buy someone or or you get someone on loan from a team like Barcelona, I think that's a big deal. And this isn't one of their rejects. Um, I was looking on Twitter and I was doing research and. A lot of people wanted uh, Barcelona fans and, and experts. They wanted him to stay in Spain, in Barcelona, to be the backup right back. So basically, you know, I, I guess you could argue that we took their number two or three right back um, on Barcelona, and and that's a huge deal. Um, he's valued at around three seven and a half million euros. Um, He's capped at 19 times for Senegal. He's going to be the starting right back for Senegal in, in, the, in the near future. Um, he's played in two Champions League games th- this past season. So I think he's a player that is someone that, you know, these are the type of players that we need to get. Um, I know that I've seen reported both things, that there is a buyout clause or at the end of the year if we wanted to buy him, there's a clause. I've seen that there isn't. I'm not sure if you have any any other knowledge about that. I've seen both reports. Do you do you know? Um, what I've seen, the, I've seen what you've seen in terms of the no buyout option. So I think Barcelona fully intend to take him back, and right. kind of how you've described, they seem to rate him quite highly internally. So I think it's just a case of they've got a new manager, Ronald Koeman's come in, and he's just obviously said, look, he's better off going and being a starter somewhere because I'm not going to play him too much this season. Right. And I think that's all that it's about for Barca. So, yeah, it, and uh, that's what I was thinking too. But like I think tonight or the past couple hours, I've seen some um, Spanish-based reporters reporting that there's, the buyout is undisclosed. So that might mean there isn't any or that might mean that it's just you know not discussed yet. But, but we'll see anyways. Even if this is a loan for one year with n- no chance that he stays, if he could get us through the group stages, right? Obviously, he's not going to play in the first game. Because of timing, uh-huh. but if he could help get us to the group stage, if he could help get us a win um, in the Champions League or a couple points, or if we you know fail to qualify in the, in the Europa League group stage, if he could help us get to the Champions League for next year, I think it's a win. I think it's 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 you know it's there's no negatives if we're looking at the pros and cons list. I I really love this move. Um, you know, I was telling you off air. I think he could be. Um, based off my research, one of the top right backs in the world within the next few years. I'm not saying now, right? So don't think that we're getting uh, a top of the elite players. But I think in the next three or four years, he could be a player that could be playing for a Tottenham, for a Barcelona, for someone that's really, really big. Um, and he could get a lot of playing time. How, how do you see this move? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy that we're getting a right back. Um, well, we should. We hopefully getting our right back because we know what happened last time with right. um, with with Yanko or Janko, however you pronounce his name. I'm not sure, but mm-hmm. he was literally meant to board the plane and never got on. So <laughs> I'll uh, I'll hold off getting super super excited until he's officially unveiled because we've been burnt recently. Until until but, Pauk releases that that 
cool vi- those cool videos that they do. Yes, <laughs> I like them. I like them, and we're kind of not on the forefront, but we've been. I think know, we are right. Yeah. Yeah, like I know Liverpool have started doing it the last couple of days with their signing. Like teams have started to do it, and I kind of think we're you know amongst the first. So right. it's nice that we're leading leading European football exactly. in that aspect. Um, yeah, in terms of him as a player, um, yeah, the thing. I am excited. Like coming, I, you don't get to Barcelona's first team if you're not a good player. Right. Obviously, I'm a little bit hesitant because not hesitant, but I'm just holding back on my judgment until I see him because of those limited games that he's played. Right. The thing that is um, that is positive is that for Senegal, at you know 19, he was starting at a World Cup, which is impressive, hmm. regardless of. Um, of your ability to start, you know, I don't think countries, no matter how poor they might be in a, in a particular position, I don't think they're just handing out caps, especially at a World Cup. So right. I th- that's something that, I, you know, I'm kind of hanging my hat on, the fact that you said he is a starter for the national team. So that's definitely encouraging. Um, yeah, just like the lack of, like, he hasn't played too much first-team football. So, I mean, I get that he's probably showed glimpses in what he has played, but until we see him, you know, I'm not going to get too excited. I wanted to ask you though about the about the Twitter thing. So I know you said that a lot of Barcelona fans were frustrated and were kind of angry on Twitter that they mm-hmm. let him go. In your, because you're more in the Twitter sphere. I'm not a Twitter sphere person myself. Right. Um, when when bulk signs players and you go on Twitter, do you find that what the fans on there say is generally accurate? So when they're upset they've lost the player, he actually ends up being good for us. Or if they're like, yeah, like good like good riddance, he is tends to be so back for us right so i tend to see it as i think i think it's pretty accurate uh when schwab signed for us i saw a lot of austrians they were upset because they saw they knew his leadership and what he offered and what i've seen so far of him in this brief time it's basically you know it, it proved what i saw on twitter right because i saw that a lot of people were upset about his leadership about his um composure on the ball his ability to make those those plat passes across the field um and i remember when they got schwab they were talking about why would you go from you know that league to the greek league it's pretty much sideways um but uh yeah so so from what i've seen it's it's pretty legit i mean think about it if it's us posting about someone like yanuli right if he leaves a lot of pal fans are going to complain why didn't we keep him uh, he's someone that could help us make the Champions League, right? So I think it's you just have to pick a part, and maybe you'll see one that disagrees. But if if you know, so far from what I saw, I saw one, I saw a Spanish reporter who's based, um, who's a, who's a Barcelona reporter, and he was and he tweeted out that you know that uh, Musa was heading to Pau, and a lot of people on that tweet were replying about how they were upset that. Barcelona should keep him. That Barcelona starting to let go of the younger players, um, so that that bodes some sort of confidence to me. And obviously, everyone's right to their opinion. You know, you're waiting, and I I, I, I see nothing wrong with that because we've been burned before. Um, soccer, not even just us, but you know, in general. How many times is there a player that is promising that has one or two bad seasons and? from going from a, a top promising player to a division two player really quickly, you know? So, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, obviously every 99% of the people can be wrong and he could be a bust. Um, but I'm hoping, and I, I really do think that he will be be- uh, helpful and beneficial to us. Yeah. Well, I'm excited then. I am excited, but let's just, uh, let's just hope he actually gets here in science. <laughs> exactly. Then right. I'll, allow my, I'll allow myself to get your levels of excited. Right, with my luck, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and see that he used Pauk to get some other deal somewhere else. <laughs> so, so let's, I think, let's talk about the game that, you know, the, the, the topic that everyone is listening, um, you know, everyone here is listening for is the Krasnodar game. Uh, we have the playoff matchup. There's two legs this game, uh, this, this round. Uh, you know, the last two rounds were just one leg. This round, it's it's two legs. The first matchup is in Russia. Um, there's a lot that we're going to get into right now. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll just ask you, um, we'll talk about the formation to start before we give any predictions or anything. Um, how do you see us lining up? Do you see 
Um, you know, the the big question mark is right back. Do you see Crespo there again? I, I, I would assume he'd be there. I don't think that you would trust Bissessoir back there. Um, do you trust Swiderski as a forward, or would you bring someone else? Would you have Zivkovic as a starter? How, how, if you were Ferreira and you were making the big bucks and living in a Thessaloniki mansion, <laughs> how would you line up? Well, if I was living in Saloniki, I don't know how focused I'd be on uh, on coaching the team, but uh, some, some nice beaches we have up there. But anyways, um, yeah, in terms of the right back, I think you're spot on. I think Crespo has to has to get the nod again. Um, Wagway obviously hasn't been announced yet, and even if he does get announced the next day or two, there's no way that they're, they're going to play him for this game. What we should say is that hopefully he's signed by Monday, so then they can put him on the list and he can hopefully play the second leg assuming all goes well. Right. Um, but yeah, Crespo, I think, is kind of, your hands are tied. I mean, Matos has been told to find another team, mm-hmm. by all reports, so he's done. Lira just kind of isn't making the squad for league games, so you can't see him turning to him and trusting him. So it'll be Crespo again, which I mm-hmm. don't mind. I mean, in over two legs, you're going to want to attack down both sides. You're going to get chances to attack down both sides. So, I mean, it's probably going to restrict us more so in this tie than it did against Benfica. Benfica being obviously the one knockout game. But I think you play it safe defensively. Two legs, still you still have to keep it tight, especially away. You don't want to get blown away and then come back on basically a suicide mission needing to chase, you know, three right. or four goals. Um, so I think Crespo will be the way to go. The rest of the team, I think, you know, um, will pick itself. Ingerson will come back in. He was rested against Atromitos. The midfield, El Caturi, will come back in for for a city. Um, the question, yeah, of Svitesky down the middle. So he hasn't been in great form. He obviously, he became a starter kind of, when was it? Was it around January, February last year? Right. Got the starting spot back. Got hot, was scoring quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And then his goals dried up. And when a player like Svitesky, when his goals dry up, he doesn't offer as much as Akbom did without the... I mean, when he's not scoring. So right. that build up, that work rate. So, look, you don't really have a choice given we don't have a striker. You start with Desky. There is the option of Solis who apparently played as a striker at times for the under-19s. Do you mm-hmm. play him down the middle and then play Zivkovic and Belkas around him? That's an option. I can't see Ferreira taking that type of risk. Um, I think he would have tried that against right. Romito, so would have given Soli some type of minutes as a striker. So I think it would be Svideski, who, to his credit against Atromito, he was working hard. He was trying to hold up the ball. He was doing those things, but he's obviously just just not as physically gifted as an art bomb to be able to successfully do it. But, you know, that's all we can ask if he, he, when he does start against um, Krasnodar, that he works hard that he presses when the rest of the team presses and hopefully gets in the right position to, to you know, pop a goal in or two. What do you think to be about starting Sudersky? Yeah, no, so I, I would say you have to start Sudersky um, based on the amount of time he got last year, based on our other options. We really don't have any in the striker position, um, who I feel like can play in the playoff of a Champions League. But you, you mentioned the point, I, I, I took note of it, of Ferreira, you know, if if he was thinking about starting Siolis up top, he would have. Um, I think that he is a, a mastermind tech, uh, tactician. I think that he's very smart. And if you always see him, he's always writing things down. Even in interviews, he's in the press conferences. He's always he's always noting things. He's always um, on top of things. He's always writing down. Uh, you know whether it's uh, uh, you know a certain player to play in the position, or you know he's he has a, he always has a notepad, wherever it is. But I think he's very very bright tactically. So if he was thinking about starting Solis in the uh, as the center forward, he will have done so already. That's why I don't think that he is, and I agree with you. I don't think that he's going to play anyone but Swiderski up top. I think Crespo is the safe bet um, playing away. Uh, defensively, he's it's not that much of a weakness, but obviously we know attacking wise it is. Um, I don't think uh, Krasnodar has the wingers that Benfica has in terms of the skill level. I'm not saying that they're not good. Don't get me wrong, but in terms of the one v one ability, I don't think that they have those players. Um, in saying that, I think if we could get out with a one one draw, 
Um, I'll take a 1-1 draw over a 0-0 draw, obviously, because that way goal. But And and um, I think if we get with the, away with a draw or a victory, we'll be fine. But I agree with you. If we go down 2-3, nothing going into the home game, it's going to be a suicide mission um, going to the in, into the last leg. But um, I guess I kind of cheated. I gave you my... Uh, my prediction um but uh yeah i i just have another question too regarding um the, the two legs we've seen in the past that in home home fixtures against big european teams and big european games there's always those early mistakes that lead to chances or goals um against spartak moscow last year or uh, a couple years ago um you know, we gave up a goal in the sixth minute to pop off, um, and you know they went. We went down two nothing pretty early on. We came back. We won that game three two. We qualified. I feel like Krasnodar and, and Spartak back then were the same the same team um, in terms of ability. Uh, I think that's the kind of you know if, if you remember they had Quincy Promise. Um, they had some really good players, some skillful players. Uh, back then so i think it's the same level that we're going to be facing now um against ajax we've given up goals early even against benfica they gave up chances um basil uh from that same year as spartak we they hit the crossbar in the first 11 minutes um do you th- do you think that it's it's an advantage of playing the away game first and then playing home game because of this fact um and i know we we both agree we both agreed last week on our episode or last episode that if we had a lot of fans, it could be a negative. Um, I know a couple of people on the forums too that that were part of they they agreed with me. Um, so, do you think that we have to address these question marks? Do you think it's just based off of, I guess, just it's just a game by game thing? Would you say because there's no fans, there's not that much obviously there's adrenaline but there's not that much anxiousness how do you see that yeah look i think my my general rule with um with two legs that knock out ties is that i know that traditionally the way or what's considered the advantage is to play the home leg the second leg at home but personally especially when you're talking from a bulk perspective and coming up against these bigger teams i probably disagree because if we just say, you know, we get a nil-nil draw, which I agree is a great result because of the away goal, you go to Dulba, you know, theoretically, you might dominate possession, dominate chances. They go down, they score one. You now have to score two. So I personally prefer, especially, I personally prefer the second leg away. Now, I know, um, especially with no fans, because the fans was meant to be an advantage. And like you discussed, though, we've kind of, we have our opinion that, you know, the no right. fans probably helped us against Benfica. So I am. It just makes it even more important to score at least one. Um, I agree. Right. So because it can be taken away from you so quickly, and if you remember the Ajax game, but with Ivic as coach in the uh, seven, 16, 17 season, was it? Yeah, I think it was. Um, where we we drew one one in Holland, and then we had the second leg at Dubai, and we absolutely like Athanasiadis missed a few one on ones. Mm-hmm. We had so many chances. We were one one. We hit the crossbar. We we're going for extra time, and then out of nothing, they just scored in the eighty seventh minute, and that was it. We had to score two in three minutes plus. The, like it was done. Right. So an away goal can really absolutely deflate you and can just kill a tie um, in two legs. So it just makes it even more important. We need to score one. Scoring two would be amazing. Obviously, that might be a little bit unrealistic, but you never know. Um, so, yeah, I would prefer probably the first leg at home where you could focus on defense, make sure you hopefully you can keep a clean sheet. But, you know, it is what it is. We've done well. We've gotten this far. We go in now. I mean, we said against Benfica it was like a free swing. We came out on top. It's kind of still a free swing, but it feels like we have a lot more to lose now because we're so close. <laughs> We've got it to this point right, a couple times right, before. Right. And Krasnodar, um, Krasnodar sorry, it doesn't strike you as like an absolute powerhouse. So we, I think a lot of Bulk fans feel like it's somewhat winnable. Mm-hmm. So it makes it, you know, I personally feel like we have a lot more to lose now. So I'm much agree. more nervous. Right. going into this one that I was at Benfica and that's a combination of the two legs of we're so close to making the group stage so 
we need to score basically that's that's my whole thing right so score in Russia. so let's hear it so what's your prediction I'll go I'll, I'll agree with you I'll go 1-1 one, one, the conservative thing um, obviously you don't want to lose um, losing 2-1 wouldn't be the worst thing right I mean just getting that getting that away goal but I think coming back with a with something to, to defend something where we have an advantage obviously a 1-0 win would be amazing <laughs> but um, coming back with something where we can defend and we can afford to give up a goal and it doesn't completely demoralize us doesn't mean we need to score two so I'll stick with the one one and fingers crossed for something better, but one one's my pick. You'll yeah, stay with that yeah, too. that that that's my prediction too. Um I'm not sure who's gonna score first. Um but I think it's to be one one. I think a two one loss wouldn't be that bad because if we win you know, if if, if we win one nothing, obviously at home we're through, but you know that those last 10 15 minutes will be nerve-wracking because like you said it you know if you get if you give up one goal we're gonna need to score another two um yep. so ultimately obviously one one draw would be fine a one nothing win would be fine and, and anything else would be just be a bonus uh but i i think it will be one one i think both teams will kind of want to score but also play more conservative um with the fact that it is a two-leg mat uh matchup so we'll see, but I, I, I'm pegging a one-one draw. Fingers crossed for that. That would be that would be a great result. That would that would be. I mean, obviously we want to win, but one-one draw will be be great. Um, yeah. So so thank you all for listening. Uh, we're gonna end it. Um, we're gonna end the podcast now. John, or any final thoughts? That's all. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, and fingers crossed for a good result Wednesday Wednesday morning Australia time so 5am so complain all you want about you're going to be at work but 5am is not a fun time to wake up at so <laughs> I, again we're, we're different here because I'd rather be able to watch it at 5am than because uh, right, it's going to be 3pm on a Tuesday um, for me perfect R- perfect time <laughs> perfect time after lunch <laughs> like what do you want yeah exactly alright well, <laughs> well uh, thank you all for listening uh, you know as Jarno said fingers crossed hopefully we'll be able to uh, our, our next our next weekend our little uh, our podcast will be about victory and how we can conserve the tie and and make the group stage hopefully we're not worrying about what we're going to need to do um, so thank you all for listening and uh Make sure you subscribe so you see when we get a uh, – make sure you get a notification so you see when we post a video. Um, tell your friends about us. Tell you know all Pauk fans around the globe about us to help us grow. So um, we'll be able to offer you more content, more times. But, uh, again, thank you all for listening and have a great night.